Uh, so thank you for joining us online today. My name is Chloe Adcock and I'm a student at SAIS and I'm also the coordinator for this year's International Development Roundtable Speaker Series. The Development Roundtable is a high profile speaker series where leaders and scholars within the international development sphere address our students, faculty, and the wider community on trends and challenges that are shaping the field. Today's roundtable is in partnership with the SAIS African Studies Program. Today will be our first fully virtual roundtable talk, so thank you to everyone who tuned in, and I want to remind you all that this talk will be recorded. On behalf of everyone in the IDEV community, as well as the African Studies Program, I would like to welcome our esteemed guest, Mr. Jude Moore. Jude Moore is a Senior Policy Fellow at the Center for Global Development. Previously, he was the Minister of Public Works of Liberia from 2014 to 2018. Prior to that, he was the Deputy Chief of Staff to President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Head of the President's Delivery Unit, where he oversaw the Public Sector Investment Program of Liberia. At the Center for Global Development, Mr. Moore has focused his research on the changing landscape of development finance in Africa, the rise of China on the continent, and Africa's response to these changes. Today, Mr. Moore will be discussing the dynamics of global power and economic asymmetries and the future of African development. He will be discussing this by asking the question, if there were an Africa summit that put the continent's own goals and aspirations first, what would be on that agenda? Before we get started with the talk, I wanna go over how we will conduct Q&A on this platform. We're gonna save Q&A for the end after Mr. Moore is finished with his initial remarks, but you can enter your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens at any time. We wanna direct you to the Q&A box uh, and not the chat feature. Your name will automatically be visible if you submit a question, and we would also likely like you to indicate the organization you're from, just like you would if this were an in-person session. So please don't be shy and go ahead and enter your questions. Lastly, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge some of the directors from the International Development and African Studies programs here at SAIS uh, that you can see among the panelists. We have Dr. Tanvi Nagpal, Director of the International Development Program, Dr. Deborah Brodigam, Director of the China Africa Research Initiative, and we also have Dr. Peter Lewis, who is the Chair of the African Studies Program. Without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to Professor Peter Lewis, who will say a few words, and then we'll get started with Mr. Moore's talk. Thank you, Chloe. Um, we're really just very delighted to be uh, able to have the opportunity to collaborate with uh, the International Development Program in this roundtable. As, as you can see from, uh, as we can see from uh, the, the tag on the bottom of the screen, there are quite a number of people tuning in. Uh, so we have very good attendance and a, and a very uh, engaged audience. Um, and I can't think of uh, a more informative uh, and compelling speaker than uh, Jude Moore. We just met recently, uh, earlier this year, under uh, a radically different set of circumstances and in a very different world. And uh, I, I was immediately uh, engaged uh, and intrigued by uh, Judy's uh, observations, his insights, uh, and in the way in which he has integrated really extraordinary public service and uh, very challenging uh, career and professional uh, experience uh, into lessons for uh, politics and policy in African development. Uh, and I think we'll explore more of that here not only in terms of having a management role in overseeing the very difficult reconstruction of infrastructure uh, and fundamental public services in uh, war-torn Liberia, uh, but also uh, being in the government uh, of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf uh, at a time when the uh, Ebola uh, pandemic challenged uh, the public health services and, and the, indeed the whole government and society uh, of the country. And so in the current circumstances where not only the United States uh, and the rest of the globe, but especially Sub-Saharan Africa is also confronting uh, a new pandemic and grappling with continuing challenges of infrastructural development, uh, Mr. Moore's insights will be 
So without uh, further delay, I'll just turn the floor over to Jude and say, welcome to SAIS uh, virtually, uh, and we hope in the future uh, actually, and uh, we're, we're very eager to hear your report. I'll mute myself there. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. And uh, so thank you to Chloe and uh, thank you to uh, everyone else at the, um, at the Africa program, the International Development Program at, uh, at SAIS. Um, good to see Deborah, uh, uh, follows her work. Um, and uh, very, very happy to be here today to share my, my thoughts on this. And I started thinking about this because uh, symmetry on Africa has become like the new en vogue thing now. Um, everybody's having some sort of summit. Um, COVID-19 has uh, sort of postponed the French one that would have been uh, um, um, later this year. Um, but we've seen the one with the UK, we've seen the one with Russia, and the Chinese one now occurs every uh, three years. Uh, the Japanese one has been going on for a while. It used to be every five years. I think they've brought it down to every three years too now. But I think the Japanese one was the first. It was before the Chinese one. The Chinese one just sort of took after TGAT. Um, and I and I started to think about it when Malta had a, a, a conference and, and Malta was going to unveil its Africa's policy. And, and Malta is so small and, and, and it was unveiling its Africa policy. And I thought to myself, you know, what would uh, uh, an Africa summit look like if it were driven from the African side? Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, making fun of Malta to the side. Uh, um, but I, and so the, the more I thought about this, I, I, you know, began to sort of gather my thoughts and using that as sort of the, the organizing idea for, for my, my presentation today. Is that first, it is hard, it's very difficult to um, unsee the power symmetry between Africa and its partners. Every summit is one, the summits occur not in a multilateral setting. They, they're, they're bilateral, but they're between a single state and, and basically an entire continent. So it'd be one country that's inviting, one head of state that is inviting 54 from Africa. I mean, ordinarily, it would be the other way, but most times when these summits occur, they occur and it's a display of the, just the difference in terms of economic power between Africa and its partners. And one of the examples that I like to give for this is when the US government under the Trump administration announced this Africa policy, this new Africa policy, Prosper Africa, it was done in Maputo. And uh, about seven African heads of state attended. But uh, the person representing the United States and unveiling it wasn't even at the cabinet level. It, it shows in terms of um, the, the, the just the, the disparity in terms of Africa's power and the power of the partners that Africa is dealing with in these settings. And, and one of the markers of the importance of a relationship between states in international affairs is the quality, is the high level engagement and, and the quality of that engagement. So it shows there. Now, ordinarily, uh, other African partners do differently, but I, I wanted to just point out that initially, there is a significant power symmetry between Africa and its partners. The second thing is, um, the, what they seek is so different. Um, so, uh, about six weeks ago, there was a meeting in Berlin, and the meeting was held by the Association of European Contractors. And they were meeting about the loss of market share in construction in Africa to Chinese contracting companies. Now you have to remember this meeting wasn't about the loss of market share for African construction business. It was the loss of market share of European construction business in Africa. And we go back to the document from Malta that I was talking about at the beginning. What Malta was seeking was a higher presence in terms of market share for Maltese businesses in Africa. Almost every single summit that we've gone to have been about the partner trying to secure market access in Africa. And so in Russia, we saw images of African, head, African members of the African delegation trying different guns, because that, you know, arms and, 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 and ammunition is mainly what Russia exports. And so 
because there's the power asymmetry, because the summit itself is driven by the economic and foreign policy interests of the host of the, the, the summit. And then thirdly, because there is no Africa, right? We have 54 fragmented units that come to the meeting as individual countries. They do not come to the summit as Africa. And so the power asymmetry is even bigger because now each country coming to the, to the summit wants to walk away with uh, what the emphasis has been on trans transactional gains. So each country wants to return, each head of state wants to return and say, we got $3 billion in MOUs or $3 billion in, in deals signed. And by putting a significant focus on transaction, when the African side is required to make policy concessions. So the, what the African side gets out of the meeting is a transactional deal, but what the, the partner side gets out of the deal is a policy one. It might be a reflection on taxes and tariffs. It might be a reflection on access to resources or local content. So the African side is expected to make these policy reforms to attract foreign direct investment when the only thing the, the partner makes is a transactional. And the thing about transactional deals is that not all of those deals reach fruition. So you can announce a $10 billion deal in over five years, none of that happens, but the policy gains are real. And so if we were then to create this thing of what it would look like, I think there are certain components that it would have. The first one is that elsewhere in the world, the, if, for example, here in the US, uh, population growth, each family is around, uh, it's below replacement rates. Uh, U.S. births are about 1.93 per family. And elsewhere around the world, that number is either at 2.1 replacement rate or below. The only place where, uh, only region of the world where population continues to grow is in Africa. So the, the, the goal of African economies is to generate 10, 18 to 20 million jobs over the next 10 years, every year. We're doing less than 2 million of those. So whatever summit we're gonna have has to be driven toward creating as many jobs as possible in Africa. Now, why is this important? Because over the course of the last 100 years, maybe more, of the history of countries that have made a transition from low income to middle income or from middle income to, to, to high income, it has always occurred by moving a large number of people, a big part of the labor force from subsistence activity to more productive activity. And the manner in which this has been done over the course of history has been through manufacturing. You know, low end manufacturing, what is uh, um, 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 fabrics and, and making clothing, and then eventually going up to higher and higher steps. And China, I guess, is the most recent uh, uh, in, in, in terms of that. It is almost impossible to imagine how Africa achieves the economic viability that we're looking for without some form of manufacturing. And so an Africa that is simply a market for finished goods and uh, a source for raw materials is never going to be at a place where you can absorb a significant number of the population away from subsistence activity into more productive activity. So uh, an, an African summit that is going to be in the interest of Africa is not only going to be targeted toward um, uh, creating jobs for, on, on, on the continent, it's going to be targeted toward also adding some value. So over the last 40 years, uh, in industrialization in Africa has failed. And it's failed for a number of reasons. On the one hand, it failed because the terms of trade in the 70s and 80s weren't really suitable and uh, a significant amount of wars uh, and, and, and civil unrest so that by the time Africa comes out of that period, the world has significantly changed. Right, most of Asia now is where manufacturing was and Africa wasn't competing, wasn't able to compete. But along with that was also just terrible policies. A good number of African countries as a means of being able to industrialize adopted import substitution. But the import substitution came with no discipline. And so African firms were protected from competition. And, and because of that, there was no incentive for them to uh, adapt their technology or become better. 
And eventually when the economies failed and they had to do changes proposed by the IMF World Bank in terms of privatizing, opening up the economy and reducing tariffs, most African firms were not competitive enough with um, those that have come from uh, externally. And I think the rise of China, and I could be wrong, but the rise of China made it really, really difficult for Africans to break into uh, uh, manufacturing at that level because no African country compiled, had the scale, the, the availability of infrastructure uh, the, and um, the skill of the labor force in a single unit as China did. And because of that, it was very difficult for Africans to break into that. So if we're going to do uh, an Africa summit that uh, is geared toward moving Africa forward, it has to be an Africa summit that takes into account the role of manufacturing in that. And, and to close, I just wanted to give an example with my own country, Liberia. In 2026, uh, the Firestone Corporation would have been in Liberia for 100 years, a whole century in Liberia. When Firestone arrived in Liberia in 1926, most African countries were still not independent yet. Well, because most of the African countries began to get their independence from the 1950 up to 1965. So a good 25 years before widespread independence on the continent, Firestone arrived in Liberia. And Firestone as a part of the Bridgestone Corporation had over a million acres to grow rubber in Liberia. 100 years or oh, 94 years after Firestone arrived in Liberia, it is still not possible to manufacture a glove in Liberia, like a rubber glove in Liberia, even though we've had a rubber industry in Liberia for 94 years. Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire account for 60% all of the cocoa in the world that goes into chocolate making. But the height of quality chocolate is Belgium and Swiss. Uh, more than 1.5 million hectares of cocoa is cultivated in West Africa. But Belgium makes as much from cocoa and chocolate as does Cote d'Ivoire, even though over a million people are engaged in cocoa farming in Cote d'Ivoire. The entire history of Zambia has been about copper. Uh, in fact, the, the soccer team in Zambia is called the Chipolo Bolo, uh, copper bullets. Uh, um, <clears throat> but very little value is added. And, and, and the story goes on, same thing with, the, with the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Even as we transition away from a carbon-based economy to renewable energy, to uh, electric vehicles, the, the, the core minerals that are required to make that transition, a significant um, reserve of that is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The pattern of trade between Africa and its partners has been such that Africa remains almost perennially a source of unprocessed raw materials, while those materials are processed elsewhere and Africa remains a market for finished products. Now the failure is both ways. The failure is part, on the part of African governments that have not invested in the infrastructure that is required, that's not invested in both the soft and hard infrastructure in terms of border uh, uh, controls, in terms of customs control, in terms of uh, roads, in terms of power. But it's also been, uh, part of the blame also lies with Africa's partners for whom this structure, this trade imbalance has, has worked. And because it's worked, it hasn't been an incentive to be able to change it. And so if I were to organize an Africa summit, a one that actually took Africa's interest into account and wanted to achieve the things that Africa wanted, these are the parts, these are the components that I would place in there. The final thing I would say is that 70% of global trade occurs in intermediate goods. So my cell phone is not manufactured in one country. A component is manufactured in one country, shipped to another, they're packaged in another country, and then it's shipped to a third. But when the OECD and the World Bank and the WTO looked at global value chains, what they found was that outside the United States, China and Germany is really regional value chains, not global. And, but Africa, Africa's trade with itself remains at 16.6 or 17 percent. And between 2000 and 2017, 80 to 90 percent of African exports were external, not with itself. So whatever limited connection Africa has with the world is better connected to the rest of the world than it is with itself.
I can't imagine an Africa summit that doesn't take into account how we finance infrastructure so that we can build regional value chains in Africa. So there's an increase in trade, intra-Africa trade. And Africa's partners, especially the United States at this moment, doesn't seem uh, to be looking in that direction at exactly the moment when the Africa continent is trying to create a single market in terms of the continental free trade agreement, the United States is in the process of negotiating a bilateral agreement with, with, with uh, Kenya. I, I, I can't think of uh, uh, an action that undermines Africa's stated intent other than that. So if I were to divide, design an Africa summit, it would be an Africa summit that supported regional integration, but also the creation of the, uh, um, the continental free trade agreement. At this point, I would, uh, Stop, I've given you the pieces that would be a part of my summit if I were to create an Africa summit and I hope uh, we can have a good exchange on this. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jude. That was really interesting. Um, we're gonna start with Q&A. So I would encourage our attendees to start typing some of their questions into the box, um, to, into the Q&A box. So we had a, a couple questions so far and uh, Two of them kind of have a, a similar theme. Actually, I'll let uh, Dr. Bradigam unmute herself and she can kick off the first question. Do you want to do that, Dr. Bradigam? Um, and remember to unmute. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you so much, Jude. That was fascinating. Um, and, and such a good idea. I can just imagine what this summit's going to look like and I want to be there <laughs> when it happens. At um, uh, some point in the past year, I was at Costco before all of these restrictions are put in place. And I was standing by a display of gloves and I leaned forward because I thought, you know, these look very much like gloves I've seen in my field work in Ethiopia. And sure enough, they were gloves that were produced in Ethiopia. Um, and I was so excited. I wanted to hop up and down because here I was seeing my my field work actually <laughs> showing up as exports to America. And there happened to be an Ethiopian family standing right close to me. And so I, I was able to tell them, look, look, these are made in Ethiopia. So, yeah. so we celebrated together. But that factory was not a Chinese owned factory, actually, it was a British factory. And they had moved from China to Ethiopia, were producing gloves there and exporting them to different parts of the world with Chinese technical assistance um, that they had paid for it. So they brought in experts from China to train their Ethiopians in how to run that factory. So the, there are some examples of the kind of thing that you're talking about, but those examples are still very few. And um, I, I wonder, I think Ethiopia seems to be the, the one country in Africa that's at the cutting edge of trying to make manufacturing happen. And yet it's still very, very challenging for them. So I, it's not so much, I guess, a, a question as a comment um, on, on the challenges that, that lie ahead. And I guess one more thing from, from our research at the China Africa Research Initiative on the industrialization question and the Chinese engagement is that where we've seen the, um, the biggest numbers of Chinese firms, the sector that they're going into in manufacturing is in building materials. So those kind of basic uh, things that are too expensive to bring in. So producing cement, producing rebar, you know, these kinds of things for the construction industry. So, so that's a, it's a good place to start. And they've had a lot of success in moving into that area. So um, let me just uh, mute myself again and see what, uh, what you have to say to respond to that. Sure, I think to your point, um, one of the things that, um, so some of my colleagues, two of my colleagues along with two other co-authors, uh, that's uh, Vij Ramachandra and Alan Gelb at the Center for Global Development, did this uh, report. And, and, and one of the things they found was that compared to comparator countries, African, the, the, the cost of industrial labor in Africa tended to be very expensive. And so, you know, thinking of it, people would think, well, it's a poor country, so, you know, you, you expect labor to be poor. But the closest, so basically, uh, you're, you're trying to, I guess the question was, can you be, um, can the cost of the average industrial labor be, can you beat Bangladesh? 
right? And in Bangladesh, the cost per year is $800. And the closest African country that comes to that cost is Ethiopia at $900. So places like Senegal and, 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 and Kenya, the, tend, the, the cost of labor tends to be high as 1,200, as 1,400, and for Ghana, it's even higher than that. And so because of that, why one would think that because of the low cost, you know, and so one of the things that Ethiopia has done to actually do this is that the government has in, in, invested significantly in reducing the cost of food. And at first, it doesn't seem connected, like what does food have to do with industrial policy? But it, it, is actually, it actually made sense because if they reduce the cost of living, then the cost of, they could drive down the labor costs. They've also invested significantly in infrastructure. They've also invested in predictable, a predictable regulatory environment. And I think these are some of the things that, that, that African countries struggle with. If people are gonna, if, if investors are gonna invest a significant amount of money, you want the regulatory environment to be predictable. There, there's hope here though. The China-centric nature of global value chains is gonna be tested at the end of COVID-19. As a part of the Japanese uh, stimulus package, there was 243 billion yen to assist Japanese companies move manufacturing out, out of China back into Japan or into ASEAN. Now, I think even US companies are gonna reevaluate their value chains, uh, especially when it comes to pr the production of, of medical materials. Now, this is an opportunity for a place like Africa, right? Because not all of those things are gonna be reshored. Uh, it's just not possible to be able to, even the Japanese are using ASEAN for the ones that can't be brought back to Japan, you would think, that there's an opportunity here for Africa. So the hope is that either the Trump administration or the one that comes after that revamps the Africa uh, Growth and Opportunity Act in such a way uh, and, uh, to make it better because the, the hope, well, the goal and objective of Prosper Africa is to double two-way trade between the United States and Africa. And the best way to do that is to be able to uh, uh, revamp and uh, go on. So maybe with the movement of value chains uh, outside of China, there might be an opportunity here for the continent. All right, um, I'm gonna read a question from the Q&A box now. So the first one I'm going to read is from Jonah Gold. Uh, he's a second year IDEV student. Um, he said he was particularly interested in your thoughts on regional value chains and the importance of intermediate goods. Uh, hopefully, this would require a hub to create final products similar to the role of Malaysia in Asia. What country or city would you envision uh, that could play that leading role, building regional value chains and creating final products? Your presentation also brought to mind Samik Lal's work on the lack of infrastructure and planning, which makes urban African agglomerations uncompetitive. And he would argue, lastly, that any summit m must center African cities as the engine for future productivity and growth. Well, he could have just made my presentation for me. <laughs> but, but, but all of those points, all of those points are, 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 are true. I mean, so uh, when one thinks about it, uh, it it's one of my colleagues, uh, Aubrey, Aubrey Ruby at the Atlantic Council uh, has, has made an argument that, and, and, and even Judd Devermont at, the, at CSIS, they both have made an argument that we, begin, we need to begin to think of Africa in terms of the cities. So think of the connection between Lagos and Abidjan, between Abidjan and Accra, between Accra, you know, and, 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 and not think of Nigeria, Ghana. And so I think African cities are going to be the, the drivers of growth and, and, and definitely any summit uh, that we, Africa summit we launch will have to take into account the role of African cities. But like you said, African cities tend to be uh, congested, but not economically dense. And so firms do not enjoy uh, uh, um, economies of scale. And that's because a lot of African cities um, were not designed properly, or uh, we've seen a, 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 the rise of unplanned settlements in African cities that sort of make, and, and because they're unplanned, it's really, really difficult for us to, uh, um, and they're built without infrastructure, they're built without power, they're built without roads, and makes it very, very difficult for firms to succeed there. So I think if we begin to put our attention on planning cities better, uh, on design of cities because they're gonna be the engines of growth, I think that's really, really important. But if I were to look for cities there, definitely, I would definitely think uh, Accra, 
Lagos, Abidjan, would be big cities, uh, especially in West Africa. I mean, already, already uh, most of Francophone uh, in Dakar, uh, uh, I would think, to on the, on the on the eastern side, I think uh, Nairobi, um, um, uh, Dar, definitely. Um, I know that Addis is already trying to position itself in terms of um, aviation hub for the rest of the continent. Uh, uh, Ethiopia Airways has been trying to position Addis as that. In, in, even in Rwanda, uh, President Kagame has been trying to build Kigali as sort of the, I mean, there's talks of doing an inland port in Kigali. There's talks of making Kigali sort of like the conference capital of Africa. And then obviously in Southern Africa, uh, Johannesburg is already, Johannesburg, uh, a Cape Town, there are already pretty major cities and I can imagine you will have uh, an even more important role, role there. So definitely I would, uh, in terms of building regional value chains, it would be around those cities. Yeah, I agree. Um, we have a bit of a follow-on question. This one is from uh, Dr. Tommy Nagpal. So she said, uh, many African countries just have one prime city, um, and large and ungovernable, and they have few economies of agglomeration and no public services. So what is the role of secondary cities that actually have connections to rural areas, um, both possibly helping circular migrants and making better urbanization possible? If you could, um, do you have any like reactions or comments to that? Yeah, I, th I think just, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, and and where we've seen there's actually been like a natural experiment for something like this, where secondary cities play such an important role in this Brazil. Um, there, there was a full study in terms of what happened, the more those cities were connected to each other and connected to the major cities. And so it's, it's hard to imagine how we're able to scale without uh, uh, with a single city, right? It's just really, really difficult to be able to do that. So I think um, those cities are gonna, and those cities probably provide us the best opportunity if we're gonna redesign cities and design them better. Because a lot of the capital cities as they are, I mean, we can tinker with the edges, but most of them are, uh, they're, they're set in their ways. <laughs> and, so, and so I think it's the secondary cities that we're going to. So I've been working with the Charter City, uh, uh, and, and, and they, they have very in, a very interesting proposition and in of the role of cities, but especially secondary cities that are built from the ground up with the, with the, with the assistance of the private sector. So I definitely agree. Uh, so we've had a couple more questions come in with sort of a similar theme of who would be uh, the right people to lead such an African summit. Uh, without excluding partners, um, but keeping African interests on the forefront. Um, do you, yeah, could you answer that question? We've had a few similar to that. Well, we already have, we already have the infrastructure in place. It's not as efficient, it's not as effective, but we have Africa, Agenda 2063. Agenda 2063 is I guess the most eloquent expression of African aspiration in terms of what they want to do. And that the repository of Agenda 2063 is the AU. So the AU is the one that is harmonizing uh, 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 African rules and, and, and policies. And so I, I think it, it has to be hosted by the AU, but I, I would host it elsewhere. I, I wouldn't host it in Addis, I, I, I would host it elsewhere. Uh, I think the uh, regional, economic regional economic communities like ECOWAS, SADC, ECA, uh, uh, um, the ESC, uh, COMESA, those will also have to play a significant role because again, we're trying to drive um, uh, regional or regional integration. But in terms of international partners, I, I can't, I, I, the U.S. is going to have to play a significant role as would Europe, but I, I think China is going to play an even outsized role. In terms of the, the competences that Africa's partners deploy on the continent, there is not a single one that does it better at large scale infrastructure than China at the moment. So whether we, in fact, uh, by 2013, 40% of infrastructure projects that were open for, placed on for, for open tender were won by Chinese companies. And Chinese companies in terms of that, uh, um, the, the value for, for money tended to be more competitive on price 
than their European counterparts. And, and, and when you think of it, because this is, I was Minister of Public Works, this sort of makes sense. When the Europeans mobilize, they mobilize with Mercedes equipment. When the Chinese mobilize, they mobilize with Sino truck, Polo, right? The, the cost of the average Chinese engineer and the cost of the average European engineer who has to go back to France for his R&R, uh, it, it's, it's, it's different. And so I'll give you an example. One of the projects we did, the total amount for the project was around $70 million. Three Chinese companies clustered in terms of their price around 69, 68.7, 70. The only European company that bid it on that project was around $86 million. And so in terms of being competitive in the African market for something that Africa requires in terms of infrastructure, it's really, really hard to get past the Chinese. And so China is going to have to play a significant role there. But the thing is, the scale of Africa's, pro uh, um, um, Africa's uh, challenges is such that Africa doesn't need a partner of choice. Africa can use every partner that it can get, and there is space on the continent and in, the, in our our ideal Africa summit for every partner. Thank you. So we've had a couple questions. Uh, I, I hope this is not too repetitive, but they one of the questions we had um, was about, can uh, regional trade um, agreements like COMESA, EAC, help aggregate the interests and the bargaining power to help um, individual African states decrease the power imbalance that you were referring to earlier? And do you think it's happening already? So I, I, I don't want to create the impression here that uh, I think it's important for us to be realistic too. On paper, Africa is one of the most economically integrated regions in the world. We have eight regional economic communities. And on paper, again, they're, they're pretty integrated. In practice, not so much. And so simply because we've signed a bigger one doesn't necessarily mean overnight all of those impediments are going to be removed. I, I like to use this example that the distance by a, by a truck taking freight between Cape Town and Johannesburg is close to the distance between Johannesburg and Lusaka. Yet between Cape Town and Johannesburg is 17 hours, but between Johannesburg and Lusaka is five hours, five days, right? Now, why, why is the same distance 17, 17, uh, 17 hours on the one hand and five days? Well, because a part of the thing is when the truck gets to the border, it's not seamless, right? So it's, it's not simply the absence of the physical infrastructure. That's the absence of the regulatory infrastructure that allows African trade to occur across borders. So even in instances where the infrastructure is in place, we still have this. So in West Africa, we have a single passport that all of us use, or the 15 countries, which means we can travel back and forth without needing a visa. If you're traveling by air, that's awesome. You, you can do it easily. If you try to travel by road, it becomes a really, really difficult thing. A trip that could last maybe 10 hours would take, up to, would take days. And, 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 and people get harassed along the way. Now, 90% of freight in Africa is carried on roads. So if those bottlenecks are not resolved, it's really, really difficult to imagine how, even if we had this conference, it happened. So there's a significant amount of, of work that African governments themselves will have to do if they're going to embrace their partners and be able to do this. So <clears throat> I think, um, but on the point of regionalism, uh, of regional outreach, absolutely. One of the recommendations that I've made was that especially with Chinese loans, as China began to cut back in terms of the availability of loans to African countries, one of the recommendations I've made was that we approach China with more regional projects. So in the last year, my last year in, Af in, in, in government, we, there is a West African project that is supposed to link Dakar to Lagos. So currently, the Abidjan to Lagos piece it's pretty much done. I mean, it's not perfect, but this piece was going to be the seven countries between Dakar and Liberia. Because when we did the studies, Liberia, it was 2014, and Liberia was going through the Ebola. And so this, we, we couldn't do the study in Liberia because of Ebola. Now, this project has the backing. It's been arranged through the infrastructure commissioner at ECOWAS, but with the help of the African Development Bank. 
I can imagine a project of this kind that if we do it with, with, with China, it first ensures because it's, it's aimed at regional integration, there's a better possibility of the countries being able to extract the economic benefit from it and being able to repay the loan. But it also increases the, the leverage because it's not a single African country that's negotiating with China, it's seven or 14. And I think if, if we have more, so across West Africa, and it's happening in East Africa too, but I'll speak of the West African one, we have something called WAP, that's the West African Power Pool. And the West African Power Pool is trying to transform the power sector in Africa to be something like it is here in the US. So sometimes the power you're using is not from the state you live in because the states are able to purchase power from a pool. And so um, the, the, the piece we did in Liberia was called the CLSG, that's so Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. So the line ran from Cote d'Ivoire through Liberia, through Sierra Leone, and Guinea. So it meant that Cote d'Ivoire would sell its excess power to Liberia, sort of reducing the need for Liberia to build its own uh, uh, power plants because it could buy the, 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 the the power from Cote d'Ivoire cheaper than it would be if Liberia built that itself. And in the instances Liberia built it and had excess power, it could sell it to the power pool. Now, these kinds of projects, if we're doing these projects as a unit, doing this project as a, re as a region, it makes a lot more sense than a small country attempting to do everything on its own. So I think those are the kinds of things that we can do to sort of reduce the power asymmetry that I spoke about in dealing with external partners. Do uh, any of the faculty panelists want to jump in or should I continue with the, the Q&A box? Okay, so I'm going to read another one. This one's a little different. This is from Jake Stockman, second year um, SCI student. What is the role of domestic consumption in the development of a manufacturing sector in African countries? Is there a demand among uh, the growing consumer class in Africa for made in Africa products or something similar at the national level? I think this is where the difficulty has been with manufacturing. Um, the African middle class has always been way more precarious than its counterparts elsewhere. In fact, um, McKinsey now notes that between nine to 18 million formal jobs will be lost because of COVID-19. And uh, up to 35 million people will see a significant loss in income and about 100 million informal jobs will be lost. And so the purchasing power uh, has always been an issue because yeah, a significant number of the people are poor. But it's sort of the, the, the uh, chicken and egg thing, right? Yeah, up to 80% of the labor force is in informal markets. Very few of them are working in wage jobs. If we have manufacturing where people, a significant number of people are earning money in factories, then of course they might be able to have money to be able to spend, right? And so <clears throat> I think uh, there is a guy out of Ghana called Bright Simmons, and he's been writing about non smoke stock industrialization. He's been talking about that might be the path uh, 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 out of this. I think it'll be a combination. I think most African countries we end up at the best after they've developed completely. We end up looking like South Africa, like Canada or Australia, where you still, I mean, up to this point, you still have a significant natural resource portion of the economy in Australia and Canada and in South Africa, where mining is a big part of the economy, but there's still a portion of the service sector, there's still a portion of the manufacturing sector. And so I think the way out, uh, if, you know, I'll, take my, my colleagues uh, Vigis idea is that part of the way out is one, the, the first thing to address will probably be um, agro-processing. So processing things that are grown there and that can be like your gateway drug to manufacturing, but also uh, going up the value chain in terms of adding value to natural resources that are there. So for example, instead of simply exporting just um, iron ore, raw iron ore, you're exporting pellets, right? So it doesn't even have to be high up, just at, at the entry level in terms of the, the, what is what has been sent out. The problem here, again, comes back to the chicken and egg thing. If you're gonna do pellets with steel, you need a lot of power and that power has to be cheap 
And so if, if that's not happening, then it's, it's hard to imagine how, how one does that. But I, I think by starting with uh, the African Development Bank, Bank projected in 2018, uh, Africa's uh, import of food was around, um, well, by 2025, it's supposed to be, it was around 35 billion, but by 2025, they projected that it would be around 100 billion. So if we're importing 100 billion of what we eat, that there's an opportunity there, right, in terms of agro-processing. And it doesn't even, I, I'm not saying that most African countries should start, you know, growing rice. The tropical products we produce, the, the plantains, the edibles, if we can find a way to be able to process those, to process them in factories or even small factories, I think that's a good place to start. But it's, it's, it definitely is an issue. If you were to, I, I talked about chocolate, if you were to make chocolate, you know, I, at the airport in Accra, I bought uh, two bars of chocolate that were made in Ghana. But they were like $7. I can't imagine the average person in Accra being able to buy a single chocolate bar for $7. That's not going to happen. Never. Well, not never, but not under these circumstances, right? Those two bars were $14. It's a significant portion of people's monthly earnings, and nobody's going to buy it. So if we can be able to make the products, um, at scale so that we can be able to sell it cheap enough for locals to be able to buy. If we're able to use infrastructure, uh, use uh, technology so that the quality of what we're providing is, is you know, good enough, if not comparable to what comes in, I think that's something we can do. The final thing I would say is that technology is helping to solve this problem. There is a, a company out of Kenya that they, they should actually pay me because I always talk about them. They, and it's called Trigger Foods. And Trigger Foods is a platform that connects farmers, small farmers, to buyers. So on the platform, uh, farmers that are registered with Trigger are uh, guaranteed 100% market for the stuff they produce. So all of a sudden, instead of farmers struggling with storage, instead of farmers struggling with um, being able to have access to markets, you have a technology platform that solves that problem for them. And I think there's opportunity on the continent for technology to help to be able to grow on um, the agricultural sector. Okay, so we've got a lot of questions. I'm going to try to get to as many as I can, but unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to answer all of them. Um, but here's the next one. Um, so this is from Nicholas Cook, who is part of the U.S. Congressional Research Service. He said, your focus on value-added activity is absolutely essential, as is the emphasis on regional integration and the intra-Africa trade that this implies. What other major goals would Africa seek? For instance, capacity building for trade and finance negotiations, greater production and value chain capacity building, and how best to pursue this? Um, it's a long question, but what about Africa responses to the U.S., European, Chinese competition in Africa, which often takes insufficient account of African interests? Um, do you have any response to that? It's kind of long. I, so let's start, let's start back. I, I think I addressed the um, foreign policy is the pursuit of a country's national interest in its interaction with other states, right? For Europe, for the last well, five years, maybe the last decade, the driving force of European policy in Africa has been uh, migration. Well, especially in the last uh, five, three to five years. And so Europe has been really, really interested in um, sort of extending Europe's borders to the edge of the Sahel to keep back, you know, uh, and Africans who are trying to get into Europe. And, and I think that focus on migration and having migration actually shape its policy toward the continents has actually uh, uh, affected. So recently, there's been big talk in Europe about matching China in Europe. For the U.S., for a long time, uh, for uh, maybe since uh, the, the bombings in, in Tanzania and, and Kenya, U.S. policy toward the continent has also become significantly wrapped up in security. And so that the, the Defense Department has way more assets on the continent than does the State Department. And so I, I think, again, by having its policy in Africa driven significantly by security interests, 
uh, once those interests begin to dry off or those interests seem as if they do not affect the U.S. homeland directly, then the, the interest wanes. And recently we saw uh, um, Secretary Esper consider withdrawing uh, um, from, 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 from Africa. So I think Prosper Africa, and that's why Prosper Africa is a good thing uh, in terms of being able to do that, and this new European attention, the new European policy toward Africa is a good thing. I, I think for the last 20 years, um, the Chinese presence on the continent has sort of changed the game. First, China's demand for Africans, African minerals have actually given Africans uh, a say in the market in terms of the price, right? It says that it's not all going to Europe, uh, you know, Asia rising as a source of Africa, uh, a market for Africa too. But also because China's ability to be able to give loans sort of forced the international financial institutions to actually reconsider the terms with which they engaged with Africa because most African countries could turn to, to China for, uh, uh, for, for, for loans. And so I think this, this, this competition hopefully is not, this great power competition that's, um, that's happening on, on the continent. I, 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 one hopes that you know, Africans are more assertive in terms of ensuring that they do not want to become uh, uh, a platform for great power competition. What else needs to happen? I think investment in, in human capital. There is this thing that we say, most Africans say this, and people who study Africa say this, that in the 1960s or 1960s, South Korea and Ghana had, the GDP were about the same. And the way I, I, I respond to that is like, it's like comparing the Nigerian economy to the South African economy. I mean, they both might be 450 to 500 billion, but Nigeria, almost 80% of all its revenue comes from petroleum. South Africa is a more diverse economy, it's the most complex economy on the, con economy on the continent. It has a service sector, it has a manufacturing sector, it has a, a, a mining sector. So if you were to look at these two economies in the next 10 years, which one do you think is actually gonna be more developed? Of course, the South African one. The, the, the endowment of, 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 of of human capital that existed in Ghana in 1956 and existed in South Korea in 1956 were not the same. And in terms of the investment that both countries made in human capital. So I think for us to go into global regional trade, intra-Africa trade, regional integration, we have to pay attention to the quality of the skill of the people on the continent. We were the fastest growing in terms of the youthfulness. And I think this is where the US again has an advantage. Um, currently, we saw that during this COVID-19, about over 80,000 African students studying at some point in China. That is, only France has a higher number of African students, but most of that has been more supplied and demand. And the Chinese have provided opportunities at exactly the moment when the West was closing up its borders. So I, I, I think uh, um, there is an opportunity here. And my idea is uh, the U.S., uh, a and M universities, agricultural and mechanical universities, if they establish campuses at existing African universities, I think would be excellent because agriculture provides a means for Africa to be able to transition. So having, so say for example, Texas A and M open at a campus in Accra, where students at the Texas at the Accra campus of Texas A and M in Africa will be able to get a, a degree in. Uh, tropical agriculture, in agronomy for tropical agriculture, or in mechanical uh, training for that. I, I think that's an opportunity there for the U.S. But uh, beyond the things that I've said, if there's anything one has to stress, is investment in education, investment in health. Thank you. That's fascinating. Are there, do you know of any of these actual campuses in Africa? Do you know if any exist yet? Uh, yes, uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, worked uh, along with the Rwandan government. Uh, there's a Carnegie Mellon campus in Kigali. So African students who want a tech degree from Carnegie Mellon can go to a Kigali and get, uh, and, get, uh, and get a degree there. I think there is a, I don't know which one it is, but there's a HBCU that has a campus in Accra. I don't know which one it is, but I can, I, I can look it up immediately that later. So, but it's just, that's just a trickle. It, it needs to happen at, 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 at a larger level. Okay. Um, so we have another question. 
where have you seen the most innovation? This is from Lola Shonabari. She's a first year IDEV student here at SAIS. Where have you seen the most innovation and progress in infrastructure and what made it so successful? Oh, I think you're muted. I'm muted, sorry. Uh, Rwanda was the first to start delivering blood and delivering medicine with drones. I think that was really innovative. Um, Ghana started doing it now with uh, COVID-19 tests in parts of the country that, that couldn't be reached. And I think that's, that's really important. The rise and diffusion of mobile money technology has been a huge thing. And in that place, we say Kenya with M-Pesa has been a leader there. Um, and, and the more expanded mobile money becomes, we can get other development outcomes, for example, financial inclusion, uh, especially women. Um, I think there, so in terms of technology, communication, but the kind of technology that Africa needs, I, it's limited innovation. Africa needs roads, Africa needs power, right? If, if, if we're gonna, uh, Africa needs clean water, we need access to potable water. Um, uh, so water and sanitation, and, and those things, you, you, you really can't leapfrog them. Uh, it's, uh, they, they require uh, tangible, physical assets in, in, in deployed to be able to do those. And, and, and again, I'll come back to my China thing, why China's partnership with Africa has been so important. Look, today, if China were to completely stop lending Africa money for infrastructure and stop building infrastructure in Africa, there is not a like-for-like -like replacement, <laughs> right? And so there have been questions about the transparency of Chinese deals on the continent about the terms of those deals, and those questions need to be addressed. But the idea that China should completely leave Africa is ridiculous. As an African, I would never advocate that, ever. Well, thank you. Um, OK, so we are at the end of the hour, and we just want to leave the last question uh, with Professor Lewis. So go ahead, Professor. Thank you, Judah. This was. Uh a remarkably wide ranging discussion and great questions and, and really explored a lot of critical issues. But the question I wanted to ask is, go straight to the, the heart of your, your uh, topic uh, or your title uh, for the talk, which is uh, a summit of our own. Where would that happen and under what auspices? Because we might observe that, uh, you know, the African Development Bank, the African Union, they have summits. Uh, or, or nearly summits uh, on a regular basis, but they have particular agendas. They have particular institutional uh, kinds of auspices and styles. So you're thinking about something that's more developmentally oriented, much more independent, much more wide ranging and venturesome. Uh, how would that come about if we were, if we were blue skying this and, and waving our wand? Well, we already, we already have a site for this. This is going to be in Accra. Uh, it's going to be in Accra. And it's going to be in Accra. It's going to be under the, the, um, under the auspices of the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, because Accra was chosen as the site for the headquarters. So it's going to be there. But it's also going to be very apparent. It's going to be clear up front that this is not going to be an annual thing that happens in Accra. It's going to move around. Right, and so the next one is going to be in East Africa, and then the, the one after that is going to be in, in North Africa, and the one after that is going to be in, uh, in, in, in Southern Africa, to ensure that the regional hubs understand that this is a fully, it's, it's all Africa, it's not. And on this one, the, Africa, the African Development Bank, the Economic Commission for Africa, um, uh, the African Union, they're going to be significant players but the lead here is going to be the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Right? And, 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 and I think that makes the most sense at the moment um, because, and I think at this, at this summit, all of the, uh, the regional economic communities will be present, right, in terms of this is what we need to do and in terms of being able to do that. So yeah, it's going to be in Accra, it's going to be under the Secretariat of the, and, and, uh, and the keynote at the event will be delivered by me, of course. <laughs> Very appropriate. 
Okay, well, thank you everyone. We are a minute past two, so we're going to end now. Uh, but thank you so much for joining. This was a really great, lively and interactive discussion. So I really appreciate everybody um, typing in their questions into the chat box um, or the Q&A box. And I also wanna thank um, Mr. Moore for coming and spending an hour with us today. It was so valuable to hear uh, from your, like, your rich experience in government and it's a really unique opportunity for our students and for the wider community. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm going to give you a little applause. Uh, we can't hear everyone's applause in person. Um, and yes, thank you for coming. And I hope that everyone has a great afternoon. All right, bye. <laughs>